it is really, really, really difficult to set boundaries when you have somebody in your life who has an addiction or alcoholism. It's really tough, but it is also probably the best thing you can do for yourself. So I'm going to talk today about why it's so hard to set boundaries with somebody with an addiction and then how you do it. And if you're new to my channel, just want you to know I was a therapist for 20 years, no longer do therapy because I began this YouTube channel, tried to help people around the world. But I also had my license as an alcohol and drug counselor. I had my LADC in addition to my license for my psychotherapy. And I spent a fair amount of time in this field. And I have some personal experience in this area, as honestly, almost everybody I know has had somebody close to them with an addiction of one sort or another. Super, super common, and we don't talk about it enough, and we don't talk about the practical strategies and what makes this so hard. So we're going to do that today. So there are four reasons I want to talk about, about why it's so hard to set boundaries with somebody with an addiction. And I think understanding these four will also help you with that next step of how to set the boundary. So number one is that when you love somebody, you want to support them. You want to help them, of course. And this is hard because we don't, most of us don't really understand what addiction is. We don't really know how to help. So we're trying to help them the way we would help somebody who didn't have an addiction, right? So if Somebody who doesn't have an addiction, who's never really had a problem before and has been very responsible, asks you for help of some kind. Yeah, of course, you're going to help them out, right? You love them. You want to support them. But the very same help that might actually help somebody who doesn't have an addiction might actually be enabling the person who does have an addiction, enabling them to continue. So this basic need and desire we have, which is lovely and wonderful, that we want to help people, makes boundaries around the issue of addiction very complicated. And the next ones are connected, so I think this will all make more sense as I go through them. Because number two, when you want to help this person, the person with the addiction, they want to be helped in a particular way. But what their main goal usually is, is to continue their addiction. Or even if they say, okay, they're giving up their addiction and therefore they want your help in order to give it up, that might be a particular mood state that they're in. But minutes later, they'll be using whatever help you gave them to continue their addiction because that's what addictions do. They trap us. They consume people. They make it the most important thing in that person's life. So that person can also be super, super persuasive. You just have to lend me money this time. I'm going to get back on my feet. It's just going to be this once. It's the last money I'll ever ask from you. You just have to lend me your car because I crashed my car when I was drinking, but I'll never do it again. This is the last time I'm turning things around. They can be so persuasive. They might even believe it. Sometimes I think it's just pure manipulation, but often I think the person is in a place where, yes, the true deep part of them wants to change. So they do believe it so they can be really persuasive. And that makes it hard to hold on to boundaries. You might even understand the concept of enabling and be like, I'm not going to enable them anymore. And then another situation arises, they convince you otherwise. And people with addictions become what I call inveterate boundary crossers. And maybe they weren't always this way, which is going to come into my next point. But maybe they weren't always, but an addiction kind of makes you that way. And that makes it really hard to set and hold boundaries with somebody who has an addiction. So the third point here is the denial. We all have denial when we have somebody in our lives who has an addiction. The denial might be around our ability to control it. We might be like, oh, I can control this. I know I can. I can fix it. I can help. That's a piece of denial. The denial might be around how bad the addiction is. The denial might be around whether or not they even have an addiction, right? Because people don't come out of the womb addicted. They don't. So probably before they developed their addiction, they were probably very different. When I worked in a substance abuse treatment place for people with all sorts of addictions and specifically women, they would transform when they put their drug or alcohol down. 
like really, it was an intensive outpatient program. So we would see them over the course of, say, 12 weeks, 24 weeks, you drug tests every day. Many of them were court mandated. So there were like very serious consequences in place that they used. And we would see people go from, you know, kind of their whole being, their whole energy, what they look like, their skin, their eyes, their approach, their and everything. They would transform. You almost wouldn't recognize them when they put the alcohol or drug down, right? And that happens the other way around too. So you maybe had this person in your life and they were wonderful and kind and generous and, you know, responsible even, and then the addiction took them and they totally changed. But that contributes to our denial. It contributes to our desire to help so strong that we try to control. And so it's hard to accept the reality of what really is right now. Just right now, the truth of the matter is that this person has become super manipulative. This person is crossing boundaries. This person is not thinking about you, not worried or concerned about you, not exhibiting all that behavior you used to love. They are focused on satisfying their addiction. And it's sad, right? So all of that contributes to denial. We're like, nope, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I'm just going to keep my focus here. It's very hard to set effective boundaries if we're in denial. Okay, the fourth reason it's really hard, which is connected to the others, to set boundaries with somebody with an addiction is that we don't really understand addiction. It's very commonly believed that somebody develops an addiction because of a problem in their life. Oh, this person lost their job and they just started drinking. Oh, they lived through so much trauma and so they use, but the real problem is the trauma, not the drug use. And I know this is controversial. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to that. And there is some truth to those things. The problem is it doesn't matter, okay? If somebody has developed an addiction and the addiction has taken over and is causing self-destructive behavior, the first thing that has to happen is the substance has to be put down. So this is a little controversial, I'll be honest, in the field of substance abuse treatment. And there are, you know, nothing is totally black and white. But in general, for a person to make any progress on that underlying trauma or those stressors, they first have to put the substance down, like the women I worked with in the intensive outpatient. Just putting that substance down, and again, it was a very tightly controlled environment, right? Transformed so much. And then once people have a significant time in sobriety, a significant amount of recovery, then it might be time to begin to deal with some of those underlying issues. But we do make excuses for people, right? If we are saying like, oh, well, they lost their job and it was really hard, so that's why they drink. Well, there's a lot of people who lose their jobs who don't pick up alcohol because of it, right? So how we respond to things is tied to our proclivities. So if I am prone to going to a substance or alcohol to numb myself out and take care of my stress or stressors and I lose my job, then that's what I'll do. If that's not my proclivity, probably not what I do. I might go home and cry for three days, right? Somebody else might just like, boom, get on the phone and just start making lots of phone calls. People have all different responses. So this lack of understanding of alcoholism and addiction leads us, you know, tied to that denial, tied to that desire to help. It leads us to trying to help in ways that actually are the opposite of helpful. I have heard so many stories of people with addictions who say, you know what, it was once my family stopped supporting me, stopped helping me out, and I was homeless, that's when I got help. People find their own bottoms, right? This is commonly known in the addiction field from all angles, is that when people hit a bottom for them, that's when they begin to get help. So our help sometimes is preventing that, right? Okay, so how do you set boundaries with someone in your life who has an addiction? I'm going to go through five points. Number one, focus on what you can control. Okay, not the other person's behavior. We all want boundaries to change the other person, but they don't do that. We've already talked about you're powerless over this person's behavior, and your boundaries need to be about what will you do if XYZ happens. 
Now, one reason this gets really, really, really difficult with addiction is that sometimes it can be a life or death issue, and it often feels like a life or death issue. And I get it. And that feeling of urgency that we get when we're in relationship with somebody who isn't paying any attention to that feeling of urgency, it's extreme. It's excruciating. But we've already like figured out that we can't actually control it. If we could have done that, we would have done it already. So I'm going to give you an example that really points to the danger of the behavior. So somebody that I worked with had a husband who, when he would drink at home, if he got upset or got mad or whatever while drinking, he would leave and get on his motorcycle and go driving his motorcycle while drunk. Like, terrifying. That is terrifying. If you love somebody and they're doing that, terrifying. What do you do? So the entire family system was tried was set up around, like, let's not let dad drink. Let's not let my husband drink. And then if he does drink, we got to all be super nice to him. But again, you can't control any of that. And all those attempts to control are ruining your health and not changing the situation. So what do you do? If you accept that you can't stop the drinking, you can't stop the bad mood, and you can't stop this person from wanting to get on the motorcycle, what can you do about it? Now, there's a number of options, but talking about it with the person when they're not drinking would be one I'm going to come back to later in terms of how to set boundaries. But having a conversation about how terrified this makes you without blaming, without lecturing, without trying to get them to understand the danger, like that's not useful. But like, I'm terrified I'll lose you. I am. Is there something we can put in place? Whatever that might be. Get rid of the motorcycle. Have the keys go somewhere at a certain time of day. Whatever that might be. But if you can't control it and that person gets on the motorcycle, you can pick up the phone and call the police. Now, people never want to do that on a loved one. And when I had this person in my office telling me that she was terrified her husband was going to die driving drunk on his motorcycle, she was unwilling to call the police because, oh, that's a horrible thing to do. My question was like, oh, so it's worse to call the police and have him get a record than him dying. This is your choice. Like, what is your choice? The rest of it you can't control. Are you willing to do that, right? So sometimes when people are arrested, they have to go to treatment. Sometimes it can help turn them around. But if you want to be safe and you want to help him in that way, that would be one way. Sure, is he going to be mad at you? Absolutely, right? But, And I'm not saying that that is the right answer, but it is focusing on something you can actually do. So hopefully that is helpful here because I don't want to use really simple examples that don't bring the level of urgency into it because this is urgent for many of us. All right, number two would be to focus on the consequences to you. So understanding this person's use is affecting you how. And then what do you want to do to set up boundaries for yourself around those consequences? So I'm going to use drinking while driving a couple times today because it's just an easy one to use. But let's say you go out with your partner to a party and if they drink, they don't always drink, but if they drink, they drink way too much and they always drive and then they insist on driving home. Well, what can you do? Well, what's the consequence to you? You're worried for your life and you're worried for this person's life, right? So if you want to talk about it with them, again, it's not about lecturing them about the dangers the fact that it's illegal. It's not about that because if you make it about like, well, you drink too much and you can't drive. Well, I drive fine when I drink. I've never gotten into an accident, right? The pushback is so easy. So it has to be about you and for you. So it could be, I'm not going to go out anymore with you unless I'm the driver. That's it. That could just be, you know, okay, they want to go out without you. They go out without you. You can go back to number one example, but it's a boundary you can enforce. It's something you can do, and it's focusing on the consequence for you. So the boundary isn't in any way really making it about the, I mean, it's a little bit about the other person's behavior, but that's not your focus. So it's like, if I'm going to go out with you socializing, I'm the driver. And if 
You'd like to have a drink? Then we are taking an Uber both ways. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm willing to do. When you set a boundary that way, there's no arguing around it. The other person can argue whether it makes sense or not, but you could be like, well, it doesn't really matter if it makes sense to you or not. This is what makes sense to me, and this is what I'm going to do. Let me know if that made sense, because it's really a very effective way to shift how you're thinking about boundaries. And the other piece of this, the consequence, right? Like so, and I brought this up in the first example, is when you talk about how it impacts you, that like this makes me worry. The other person might try to argue that or they might tell you you shouldn't worry or that you're dumb to worry, but they really can't argue with it. If, well, when that happens, I worry, I get to say that. There's really nothing to argue about. So thinking about your own emotions and how those play in and then what you are willing to do or not. All right. Number three is to focus in on the pattern of behavior for yourself. I'm talking here. I'm not talking about focusing on the pattern of behavior in your conversations with this person, you're trying to convince them to change their behavior. My recommendation is to move away from that because it's wearing you out, it's exhausting, and it's not working. So shifting away from telling them about the pattern and really thinking about it for yourself. Because if it has been a long-standing pattern, so I'm going to take a different example, same general topic, and give you two different examples. But Let's say somebody in your life calls you in the middle of the night all the time because let's say they go out and they drink too much and they can't drive home so they call you for a ride or they end up someplace and they have no money and they need you to come get them and you get up in the middle of the night and you go pick them up because you're worried about them. You don't want them to die. But it's a consistent pattern of behavior. You can't change this and you can't save this person. We can't save people from their self-destructive behavior. So the pattern is the important piece. So using a different example, when one of my kids was a teenager and would go out and party, I said to her, look, you can call me in the middle of the night. If you have been drinking and can't drive home or you're with friends and one of them drinks, wake me up, call me. I will pick you up. I won't get upset. Now, I put that in the place because I lived in a suburb at that time where the teenagers drank enormous amounts, unfortunately. And the other piece of it, unfortunately, is that it was facilitated by parents. Like, anyway, that was appropriate because one, she was my teenager. Two, it didn't happen all the time. It wasn't a continual pattern. It was like, okay, I want you to know you can do this. And she did do it probably three times over the course of about three years. And one of the times I went to pick her up, she hadn't even been drinking, but the other person who had driven her there had been drinking. And when I got there, the mother, like the parent of the household, was totally drunk and was upset at my daughter for calling me. So in a situation like that, yes, as a parent, you want to be there for the person. But if you're an adult and the other person is an adult and they're still doing this and it's repeated and they are continually getting themselves into that situation, you are sacrificing your health and well-being and facilitating their behavior. So that's why really looking at, is this a pattern? Because, and this goes back to, I think, the point I made about why it can be hard. When we love people, we want to help them. So if you want to help somebody, yes, help them. But if it's a repeated pattern, then it's moving into the black hole issue, right? Like, this is a black hole. Nothing I do is actually going to change the situation. So my waking up in the middle of the night and then being too exhausted to work in the morning is throwing things into the black hole. It's not helping. It's not doing anything. I have to look at it as a repeated pattern. It's hard. It's sad. But that needs to be the focus. Okay, the fourth point I want to make here is setting up boundaries around your own behavior and consequences around your own behavior. Again, so we always think about, oh, the boundary has to be a consequence for the other person. No, that doesn't work. The consequence is for you and about you. So using that being woken up in the middle of the night, if you decide at some point, can't do this anymore, can't get woken up in the middle of the night, I'm not functioning, I'm not doing well at my job, I just can't do it anymore. 
I can communicate it to the other person, they'll probably still call. So I could set a boundary for myself that says I won't pick up their call in the middle of the night. And now again, I'm not saying any of this is easy, and I know it's not. But if you set that as a boundary, if you get to the point where you decide pattern clear enough, you can't help it, you're going to set that as a boundary for yourself. What's the consequence for yourself? Make something up. I worked once with a very behaviorally focused therapist, and it was really very, very, very effective. But it could be like, okay, if I do take their call in the middle of the night, I'm going to do 10 push-ups. I don't like to do push-ups. I don't know. You might like to do push-ups, and 10 may be no big deal. But it's sort of a drag. But we could set up a consequence, even if it sounds like a silly one, that then reinforces for ourselves that we don't want to engage in that behavior. Okay, more serious thing. And this also is tied to like one reason it's so hard to be in a relationship with somebody with an addiction is that the behavior is so crazy making that we end up engaging in behavior that we don't like. It's not who we think we are, right? Because you might end up screaming at the other person often and you don't see yourself as a screamer, but this behavior can make us so crazy. So a boundary for yourself could be, I won't scream anymore. All right, well, if you do, what's the consequence for you? The consequence could be tied to the behavior. Well, the consequence is I'll spend an extra 15 minutes in meditation. Doesn't really matter all that much, but make it for you and about you. All right, hope that made sense too, because that's a really important one. And I do spend more time on all of this in my boundary program. So I will link it here, show you a quick flash of it, but check it out because it really does go into all of these items in more detail and really about how you begin to feel okay about yourself so you can put these things in place because you matter, your life matters, your health matters, and making yourself miserable because somebody else is engaged in self-destructive behavior that's going to continue whether you're miserable or not, not the best. Okay, so coming back to it. Number five, the last point I want to make here is about how you set boundaries with this person. Because some of these boundaries are about having a conversation with the person with the addiction, seeing if you can come to some kind of agreement. But in order to do that, not when they're using. Setting boundaries, trying to correct their behavior, trying to do anything when they're using, not useful. So to have the discussions when both of you are not using substances, not threatening. Boundaries are not about threatening. Threats don't work. Threats are repeated over and over and they just become, you know, they've heard it before and they know you're not going to enforce it. So boundaries are thought about ahead of time, strategically thought about, discussed. Sometimes you do need to talk to other people, which I'm going to give you a resource on that. But really thinking them through and then following through. It's not about threatening. And assertive communication is the best communication style. I also have a whole section on that in my boundary program. But super important to not have overly aggressive, not have passive, and not have passive aggressive. Calm, clear, assertive, you know, like this is how it is, right? Okay, this behavior makes me really anxious. I no longer want to engage. My plan is to, unfortunately, call the police if you get on your motorcycle trunk because I don't want my husband, you, to die. So that is what I'm going to do. There's not a threat there. There, it's clear. It's a communication, as long as you intend to follow through, right? No threatening. Or it's the calm assertion of, if we go out, if I go out with you, I'll be the one driving. So I hope this has been useful for you. I do want to highly recommend that you access support, because if you are in a relationship with somebody with an addiction, it is a very, very hard place to be. Al-Anon can be super helpful. It's a 12-step program for friends and family members of people with addictions, with people with alcoholism. And there's Al-Anon, there's Nor-Anon if the person is addicted to narcotics. There's a number of different Anon programs. They're online. 
Their written material can be super helpful. The support, really important. And honestly, the 12-step program, I do think it was just a brilliant program. I mean, it was designed a flash of genius because it really does combine cognitive behavioral elements along with accepting the reality of what we can and can't control, what we're powerless over. And if we're in the relationship, if we're the codependent, we're powerless over the other person's addiction. We're powerless over their behavior. Doesn't mean you're giving up. Doesn't mean you're excusing things. It means you're putting your focus on what you can do. So I highly recommend Al-Anon. I know people don't always like group programs. I'll probably make another video on that topic at some point. Check that out. Check out my boundary program and understand that it is not your fault and it's not your responsibility to control the other person's substance use because you can't. You truly can't. So knowing that you will need support and healing and information. And I do wish you health and healing and I'll see you next week.